Uh, tonight, however, he's here to shock you, stun you, surprise you with the tale of Nikola Tesla, the only scientist who could ever be played by David Bowie. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please give a great lives welcome to Bernie Carlson. Thank you very much, and I'm so grateful that you are, were able to come out tonight and uh, join us here in the Dot Auditorium. I am the proud parent of a UMW graduate who's uh, joining us tonight. She, uh, Rachel, graduated in 2016 with a degree in psychology and a minor in social justice, and I have to tell you that the last time I was in the Dot Auditorium was when the admissions department or office was briefing us on a variety of things about what to think about in terms of a student coming to Mary Washington and one of the things they reminded me is is, is, is how wonderful it is that, that students that come to Mary Washington are able to grow develop and change their minds and they told us that day that our our daughter would probably change majors at least twice I'm happy to say that she only changed majors once um, and was very happy here. And so I'm very grateful to be here and uh, to spend some time with you talking about uh, Nikola Tesla. My wife, is uh, Jane, is also here, and the book is uh, dedicated to her. I wouldn't have been able to do it without her. Um, and I'm very grateful to Bill Crowley and um, uh, Brian Jones and the Dovetail Group for supporting tonight's lecture. So, as you can see here, and I'll tell you more about this picture, Mr. Tesla loved to come up with great photographs. And later on, I'll tell you that there is a story behind this picture, uh, but I will allow you to uh, wonder about that in the meantime. Okay, now, I'm a historian who deals with inventors and entrepreneurs and business people. And you might very well sort of say, oh, man what's this guy going to do? I mean, you know, at the end of the day, why write biographies of inventors, entrepreneurs? At the end of the day, what shapes technology, the thing that I'm really interested in, are the development of science, where scientific theory is at a given time, or what, what will the marketplace pay for? So big structural forces shape technology, science markets. So what do we need individuals for? They're, they're kind of incidental to the, the, the march of science. And I emphatically say, no. Individuals make choices and shape the evolution of technology and business. And this is especially true, ladies and gentlemen, if we want to think about disruptive technologies. The technologies that shape the structure of industries, the way businesses do business, the way we live our lives. Where do those technologies come from? And as they used to say on television, submitted for your consideration, those technologies come from the minds of highly creative individuals. And tonight, I want to share with you the story of one of those highly creative individuals, Nikola Tesla. Now, to underline what I'm trying to say, Again, can submit it for your consideration. Let's talk for a moment what my economist friends love to talk about. And they love to talk about the fact that there are cycles in the course of history. And in particular, when you talk about technology, we can talk about what are called Kondriyev curves. Kondriyev was an economist in the early Soviet era in the 1920s when they were trying, Lenin and others were trying to understand you know, is, where's technology going? Can the new revolutionary society in the Soviet Union get on the right curve? And they argued that, or Kondryev argued, that there were a series of waves over the course of history. This starts out in, in essentially 1819, 1820, takes us up to 2009. And so you've got a wave, it's railways and steel. I know you may not be able to read this. You have a third wave, that's electrification and chemicals. You have a fourth wave, you know, sort of in the mid-20th century, that's automobiles. You have an information age here that's, you know, uh, you know, 1970 to 2010. And, of course, 
Those of you that you know had money in the stock market knew that about 2008, the bottom fell out of the market. And we're still debating, you know, with my colleagues in the engineering school, what's that next wave going to look like? Now, it's very easy to look at those waves and sort of say, ah, well, they're just inevitable. They're like waves on the ocean. They're just going to come up on the beach, and there's nothing much you can do about it. My interest is who are the people that shaped that wave in the late 19th century that was built around electrification. Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, and above all, Nikola Tesla. That wave came when it did, had the impact that it did, had the shape that it did because of individuals like Tesla. So what did Tesla invent? Tonight I'm going to tell you a story that he developed two disruptive technologies. Most people, you know, their careers are all about producing one, dis one amazing disruptive technology. Tesla managed to you know, pack into a very, live, very active life, two. In the 1880s, he develops the alternating current motor. Okay? The motor that runs your refrigerator, drives the elevators that you ride up and down on, basically powers the, the hard disk drive in your computer. That motor is a Tesla motor. Okay? But for a second act, in, this, in, this, in the latter half of his career, he decided that the world should transmit power, electric power, without wires. And so he's an interesting individual in that Tesla was part of both the power revolution, like Edison, but he was also part of the communications revolution, like Marconi. Not surprisingly, he had his differences with both of those rivals. Tesla, for me, offers an excellent opportunity to wrestle with the question as to where do those disruptive technologies come from? Be easy to sort of say when we talk about somebody like, you know, like Steve Jobs. Oh, it's genius. Or somebody else. It's just luck. They were the right guy in the right place at the right time. I want to argue that there's more to the story than that. We don't need to fall back on explanations that are based on genius or luck. Now, Tesla, is, is, is what I'm trying to say in this slide, has significant real-world contributions. He really did make some significant technological breakthroughs. Nevertheless, in our day and age, he is also a figure in popular culture. And his, his presence in popular culture can kind of be broken down into three things. There are people that sort of say, he's a genius, the most brilliant genius since Leonardo da Vinci. Okay, well, I'm not going to really argue with that, but, you know, they really kind of push that. Or there are people that go the opposite direction and say, he's crazy. He's a complete nutcase. He's a lunatic. You know, he was an eccentric dreamer who came up with all of these brilliant things, but at the end of the day, he died penniless, bankrupt in New York City, and his best friend were pigeons. Okay? So what are we going to do? Is he a genius or is he a lunatic? Or there is door number three. He was a space alien. Now, inquiring minds want to know if he was a space alien who came from Venus, how did he get here? This week, <laughs> we found out There he is, coming to Earth. Or, if we were in the 1950s, an a interesting woman named Margaret Storm, who was a prophet of the New Age before there was a New Age, uh, suggested in the 1950s that Tesla, and she channeled Tesla. She basically said, I, I, I've talked to Tesla, he's telling me the truth, you know, and here's what happened. He actually came to, the, he came to Earth on the wings of a giant dove. Okay, now... I, I, didn't, I didn't know what to think about this, and then finally I had the opportunity, thanks to my wife Jane uh, and eBay, to uh, get Margaret Storm's book, which is titled On the Wings of a Giant Dove. book came, opened the envelope, opened it up, and started said, okay, here's a real serious source. It's printed in green ink. Now, boys and girls, if you are a student of history, I'd always be careful of books printed in green ink. How many books... Have you ever seen printed in green ink? Well, Margaret Storm decided for whatever was going on with Margaret Storm to print this book in green ink and tell us that Tesla came to the earth on the wings of a giant dove. Now, you could say that that 
that's kind of bizarre. And a you know, nice, self-respecting boy that, you know, went to a liberal arts college uh, up in Massachusetts, very similar to Mary Washington, then went to the University of Pennsylvania, pretty serious school. What are you doing dealing with a guy who some people think is a space alien? You know, how did you, what's a nice boy doing like you in this business? So I spent 15 years writing, studying Tesla. And let me tell you what made him intriguing, puzzling. You know, why did, you know, my wife says I never jump out of bed in the morning. It's true. I do get out of the bed. I don't necessarily jump, but I do get out of the bed. What got me out of the bed for 15 years thinking about Tesla? Tesla does not neatly fit into any pigeonholes or categories that we typically use to think about individuals. Yes, he was an inventor who, as I'll show you tonight, developed some successful cutting-edge technology. But unlike the way we think about technology today, Tesla was not a scientist. He was more like an artist. What do I mean by that? As you'll see, he was more intuitive and less experimental. He was really interested in the meanings, the values, the ideas that people associated with his creations, with his inventions. And he was a performer. He loved to be in, an, in front of an audience like this tonight and get your attention and get you to imagine new possibilities. Nevertheless, he was an entrepreneur. Many people say Tesla had no sense of business. Yes, he, he died bankrupt. He, 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 you know, he failed. He fa you know, his companies never came to anything. But he had a business strategy. He had an idea for how he was actually going to make money. And it worked part of the time. So the puzzling thing, if you're a biographer guy like me, is how do you integrate these roles? How is he an inventor, an artist, and an entrepreneur? So to answer that, oops, it helps if you push the right button. Okay. I came early on and realized that the book ought to be called Ideal and Illusion. And my publisher went, oh, you academic types. Nobody's ever going to read this book if you call it Ideal and Illusion. But Ideal and Illusion is, is how I make sense of this puzzle that is Tesla. His whole life is this interesting blend back and forth between ideal and illusion. When he was inventing, when he was doing his creative thing, Tesla believed that he was trying to find the fundamental principle behind an invention. That hidden back there was this idea in a pure platonic form and that if he could pull it down out of the heavens like Prometheus did stealing fire from the gods according to the Greek legend then he would have something really important and he always said my ideas are always rational because I am an exceptionally accurate instrument of reception in other words I can tune in I can find that perfect ideal now the problem with that is, 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 is that Tesla could see the ideal, he could work it out in his mind's eye, in his brain, um, but the rest of us, or as we set, like to say in the Carlson family, we're either dumb bunnies or we're dumb bunnies. Okay? And, and we can't necessarily grasp the ideal. J.P. Morgan may be a brilliant banker, but he can't see <gasps> the perfection of a wireless power system. So how do you get Morgan on board? How do you get an audience to work with you? You have to create illusions. You have to tell stories, metaphors. You have to create something that people can grab onto and believe. Ideal and illusion. Now, I don't mean that Tesla was a quack or, or that he was a faker, but he understood better than any of his contemporaries, that the way you get people to invest their money and their lives and their beliefs in a new technology is you've got to tell them a story, you've got to create a metaphor that they can grab onto. This sets up the tension that I wrestled with for 15 years. Did Tesla's illusions 
ultimately interfere with his pursuit of technological ideals. Illusion and ideals. That's what drove Tesla forward. So where did he begin? He was born in 1856 in what was for many years Yugoslavia in the Balkans. Uh, he was born to a Serbian family, but he was living in what is today and what was also then, what, was, what is today Croatia, what is, was then the military frontier of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Okay, and you ever want, if you ever have to go to this part of the world, boy, you want to make sure that you understand who you're talking to. I, I was raised, as I said, Holy, I went to Holy Cross, Holy Cross College, I actually went to Catholic high school, Catholic grade school, and so I, I was raised Catholic. I've got, you know, Jewish daughters, and I've got, a press, a, you know, I now go to a Presbyterian church, but over there, you need to be real careful, because the first thing the Serbians want to know is, is, are you Catholic? And if you're Catholic, then, you know, we got a problem with you, okay, because we're Serbian Orthodox. Okay, so complicated religious and, and ethnic differences in this part of the world. Okay, so Tesla's family is Serbian, Serbian, but they're living in a Croatian part of the world, which is Catholic, and on top of that, it's ruled by the Austro-Hungarians. Complex world. Not surprisingly, that complex world is internalized by Tesla, and pretty early on, as a child, when he's 8, 9, 10 years old, he starts to have just terrible nightmares. Now, Tesla, like his sisters, had an incredible visual sense. If you said to Tesla when he was a little kid, juicy apple, Nikola, he could conjure up, kind of at arm's length out there, a juicy red apple. Now, some of us could probably do that and sort of see the apple out there and think, yeah, it's a pretty cool apple, it's bright red, so on and so forth. Tesla couldn't erase that image. That image would persist with him. And so you can imagine what kind of nightmares living in a complex socio-political world Tesla had. By the time he was about 12, he finally decided, I'm going to get over these nightmares and these terrible night visions, and I am going to willfully control my imagination. And instead of seeing scary things, I am going to develop a sense of thinking about positive, happy things. And that included going to strange foreign exotic lands, and to get there, he would fly. So not surprisingly, he was about 12 years old, he decided he was going to build a flying machine. Now, it probably, we don't know much about it, it probably looked like a jetpack, so, sort of a thing that he strapped onto his back, and he had some sort of helicopter thing on it, and you know, some sort of pump or cylinder in the inside. And he built a prototype of this thing, and lo and behold, what he imagined and then built sort of worked. The cylinder inside the jetpack kind of turned. And Tesla was delighted. He thought, oh my God, what I can imagine in my head can actually exist out there in the real world. What more powerful driver to be an inventor than to sort of say, I can picture it, I can see it in my imagination, and then it actually happens in the real world. That drives Tesla throughout his life. If I can picture it, maybe it's real, maybe it's valid, because it works in the real world. Now, the pro one of the challenges with that sort of approach is, is as you were always looking for what philosophers would call confirmatory evidence. Check, it works, I saw it work. The cylinder in the jetpack turned just a little bit, so I must be on the right track. Keep that in mind. The whole part of the story that I won't go into, but in the 1870s, Tesla convinces his father that instead of going to a seminary to become a priest, like Tesla's father was, young Nikola uh, was permitted to go to engineering school. And so he goes off to Graz, Austria, where he studies engineering. And while he's there, he has the idea that he is going to build a better electric motor, okay, that it is going to be based on a rotating magnetic field. But as a student in engineering, in an Austrian engineering school, there's not a lot of electrical engineering. The first electrical engineering program is actually created 
1884 at MIT in the US. Before that, if you wanted to study electrical engineering, you did what Tesla did. You went and you apprenticed with an up-and-coming high-tech company. And that's exactly how Edison, excuse me, Tesla got his, his electrical education. He worked for a variety of Edison companies, first a telephone company in Budapest, then a lighting company in Paris. He did a good enough job and he was transferred to the New York office. Um, but no longer, no sooner than he had been in the Edison offices, the Edison machine works in New York City, um, then after about 10 months, he basically said to Edison, I'm not really interested in being here and I really want to pursue my vision of an alternating current motor. And so with the support of a couple of business backers, they don't always, I had to kind of rediscover these guys. They don't sh show up in any earlier Tesla biographies. A man named Charles Beck and Charles Peck, excuse me, and Alfred Brown, Tesla began to develop a new alternating current motor. Now, I suspect, since we are at a liberal arts college, that you are not necessarily prepared for the next, for a couple of slots. Now, I promise you there are only three highly technical slides, and this is the first one. I just wanted to warn you, okay, so if you're a little nervous about this, that's okay. We're going to, this is the first of, and I'll tell you when the next two turn up, but this is the first hairy technical slide. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, tonight you are going to learn everything you ever needed to know about electric motors. Okay, first off, what you may remember from one of those fine science classes that you had in the third or fourth grade is, is this, there are magnets, and magnets have north and south poles. And unlike magnets, the north pole and the south pole like to come together. They like to hug each other. We're almost at Valentine's Day, so I can say that. Okay. Like magnets, okay, a south pole and a south pole, or a north pole and a north pole, do not like to be with each other, and they repel. Every electric motor, DC, AC, whatever you want to call it, always has two pairs of magnets. Could be electromagnets, could be permanent magnets, okay? The reason why the shaft spins in an electric motor is because those pairs of electromagnets at any given moment have a north pole and a north pole or a south pole and a south pole facing each other and so they push away and the rotor goes wee. That's a highly technical term. I had to go to years, years of history of science class to be able to say that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Tesla's ideal vision is, 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 is he said, I am going to do I'm going to make the perfect electric motor. Everybody has worried about the fact that the way you make an electric motor work and, and get those two sets of magnets to be in opposition to each other is by changing the electric field in the rotating part, okay, which, not surprisingly, is called the rotor. And then there's a stationary set of magnets, and yes, People in the first row already know the answer. That's called the stator. Okay, so everybody worried about having a complicated, crappy switch mechanism in the rotating part of the electric motor called an armature, and Tesla said, let us be done with rotating switches, or what was called in the technical parlance, a commutator. So, consider this slide right over here. All of this stuff is the electric generator over here. Okay, this is the electric motor. I know it doesn't look much like an electric motor, but humor me. Okay, the stator is the donut part. The rotating part is in the middle there. Okay, Tesla's big idea was is, 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 is if I make the magnetic field change over time in the donut, that will induce an electric current, which will induce an electromagnetic field, which will be in the opposite direction of the electromagnetic field, in the stationary part and the whole sucker will turn, okay? Now, that's all you actually need to know. He figured out a way to use alternating currents to make those two, electromag those two electromagnetics move or repel each other. For those of you, particularly the children in the audience and children of all ages, when you come to sign my books, I have a handy dandy demonstration using permanent magnets that you can play with that will show you what I mean by a rotating magnetic field.
Okay, but it's too small, so I can't necessarily do anything with it here. Okay, this was a major breakthrough. In 1886, while he was working in a laboratory in downtown New York City, he basically realized that he could use alternating currents, make a new form of AC motor. Now, his backers, he basically said, told them that he was able to do this. Let me go back here. And he brought in his backers and he sort of said, look, I can make this work. So he had the electric generator, he had the donut, he had this all set up in his laboratory, all sorts of wires everywhere and this, that, and the other thing. And he basically, for the rotating part, he took a shoe polish tin. So you remember those Kiwi shoe polish tins that are sort of like, about like that? You know, so he had an empty one of those, punched a hole in the middle, put a thumbtack in it, and he basically took that shoe polish tin and he dropped it in the middle of that donut. And yes, again, that technical term, the, he dropped the, he dropped the uh, shoe polish tin in the, in, the, in the middle of the donut and it became the rotating part of his electric motor and it went whee! And Tesla was elated. And I'm convinced that his backers sort of peered into the donut and said, you've been working for us for 18 months. You brought us down here. You think you've had a major breakthrough. And what we see is a tin can spinning in a donut. Isn't that special? And they didn't really want to invest in it. And there's a whole bunch of complicated store business reasons for all of that, but they looked at it and they go, eh, I don't think so. Now, this is where that illusion part comes in. Now, most of us would have put our tail between our legs and hung our heads low and never ever invented anything again, but not Tesla. Tesla thought about it and he said, I don't have the right story to go with my experimental apparatus. So a couple days later, he goes to see them in their business offices, and he says, you know the story of Columbus and how Columbus got the money from Queen Isabella to sail the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria in, you know, to America in 1493. And his backers, Peck and Brown, say, yeah, 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 we know the whole story. Fine, fine, fine. You know, you know basically... To, you know, and the, the story that they were discussing is the fact that Columbus can't get any money out of Queen Isabella because he's basically arguing with all the scholars in the archives, or excuse me, in the in in the court, and and basically Columbus says, "Can you scholars make an egg stand on end?" And and the scholars go, "Oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know." And so Columbus says, "Bring me the egg." And I always picture that the egg comes out on this little, you know, purple pillow, you know, and, uh, and Columbus takes the egg, and he gets a spoon, and he whacks off the bottom of the egg, and he stands the egg up on end. And Queen Isabella looks at him and says, you're my kind of guy, and gives him the money. So Tesla says to Peck and Brown, his backers, he says, if I can make the egg stand on end and make it spin, will you give me money to finish this invention? And they say, sure. So he runs home, and he goes out and he buys himself a big copper egg. This is the donut coil down here. And he calls him in the next day, and he says, okay, you ready? And they say, sure. And he turns on the electric power, and the egg sits there, and it starts spinning around. You can find this on YouTube, and you can see any number of versions of this. And the egg spins faster and faster until it comes up on its long axis, and it's spinning up and down like a top. And his backers look at him and go, you really are onto something here. And they back him, and they help him get strong patents, and they help him negotiate a deal with George Westinghouse. So Tesla learned from those backers a business strategy. Patent, promote, and sell. Get strong patents, publicize the work, which Tesla did through lectures, and stories in the engineering newspapers. And then when you got people really, really excited about it, you negotiate a lucrative contract and you sell the intellectual or you license the intellectual property. And in Tesla's case, George Westinghouse buys the Tesla patents and in recognition for the help that his backers gave him, Tesla gave the lion's share, five-ninths, of the proceeds from that contract to Peck and Brown. Now, you may sort of say, 
Well, that's sort of an interesting strategy, patent, promote, and sell. What do you think your average Silicon Valley entrepreneur is doing in terms of deals right now? They're doing Tesla-like deals. They're not going into manufacturing. They're getting strong intellectual property. They're promoting it, and they're selling it to the highest bidder, in their case, venture capitalists. Tesla goes to work for Westinghouse for a few years, um, and he quickly becomes bored because it's routine engineering. How are we going to take your motor designs, and are we going to put them into streetcars? And Tesla pretty quickly realizes, I don't really want to do this. So, where do you go if you're bored and you've had it and you're quitting the second time? First he quits Edison, now he quits Westinghouse. Where do you go um, to think about the next big thing? Well, there's no Disneyland, so Tesla goes to the, goes, runs off to Paris and goes to the World's Fair. In 1889, Paris, Tesla visits the Paris World's Fair. This is the fair where they, they erect the Eiffel Tower. There's the Eiffel Tower that you can see. Um, and they're sipping hot chocolate or, you know, or, uh, you know cock cocktails in, in cafes along the boulevard. He meets the graduate students of a German scientist, physicist, named Heinrich Hertz. And they say, let me tell you what Hertz has been working on. Hertz has figured out that the radio waves that were theoretically predicted by a famous Scottish scientist, James Clerk Maxwell, really do exist. And here's how, you know, Hertz figured this all out and, and worked it out. Now, this is the second Harry technical slide. Over here, ladies and gentlemen, we have a Rumkoff coil, just kind of like a transformer. We also have a battery, that's B for battery, and we have a telegraph key. This, all this stuff up here on the upper half of that diagram is the transmitter. The thing that looks like a pierced earring down here is the receiver. I did say that this is very crude. Every time that Hertz opened and closed the telegraph receiver, he got a spark across H right here, and anywhere he wandered around his laboratory holding this thing that was actually probably about 12 inches in diameter, this earring-like thing, he would get a spark between the gap in the earring. And Hertz demonstrated that you really could generate these invisible waves, electromagnetic waves that we would call radio waves. Tesla hears about this in 1889, and he goes home in 1890, and he goes, holy cow, this is really cool. How can I soup up the, Tesla, the, the Hertz apparatus and make an even better wave generator? And he comes up with the Tesla coil, and that's the circuit diagram I'm saving up my third hairy technical diagram for a few moments, so I won't explain that. But he comes up with a Tesla coil. By the way, Tesla decided that the Hertzian waves were less like light waves and more like sound waves. And so on a later visit, Tesla goes to Europe, stops by Hertz's laboratory, and says, Heinrich, I think he probably actually said Heine, but, you know, you know, I'm just assuming a degree of familiarity among scientists. Probably it's not right. But anyhow, he goes to Hertz and he goes, Heinrich, I think you're wrong about your scientific explanation of the waves. And um, tells Hertz that the, the waves are more like sound waves and less like light waves. Needless to say, Hertz manages to not mention in his diary, which is pretty detailed, this visit from this lunatic American. Okay. Now, you got the Tesla coil. I'm going to show you Tesla coil in a moment. Uh, what can you do with electromagnetic waves? Tesla decides that the big opportunity is to try to pull one better on Edison. Edison has got an electric lighting system with incandescent bulbs, um, but they require a lot of obnoxious wires. Maybe we can get rid of all these wires. And so Tesla proposes in a lecture uh, in 1891 that you could have a wireless lighting system. That if you take a tube with a small amount of gas, like neon gas, and you put it between two big electrical panels, which you could have on your walls, you can make 
the tubes light up. So in a moment, this, this image shows, you know, the lights on. Tesla's going to dim the lights in the lecture hall in New York City at Columbia College, and he's going to step between this big zinc panel and this big zinc panel, and those big fluorescent tubes that he's waving around are going to light up. And so, yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's a small approximation, but let me show you what it was actually like. I have, my, I have my official Tesla coil right here. It's a small one. It's, it's kind of aging like I am. And then I have a tube filled with a small amount of neon gas. And when I come within the range of the, the radio waves coming from the coil, it lights up. And it is... basically getting wireless power from the Tesla coil. Yes, so you don't want to necessarily try this at home. Those of you in the front row may be able to smell the ozone. Nothing like ozone in the morning. Okay, so Tesla comes up with the idea that he's going to have a wireless lighting system. Um, and he promotes that actively through a series of demonstrations, the lectures. Remember, patent promotes sell. So he's in that promote mode. Can we get people excited? Well, in the mid-1890s, some of you who have uh, had economic history know that there was a terrible depression. This the second most uh, difficult depression or economic downturn in the history of the American economy after the Great Depression in the 1930s is the Panic of 1893. So the mid-1890s is not the time to introduce a new technology. So Tesla tries. He, uh, he brings in friends. Yes, that really is Mark Twain. And Mark Twain has got a coil with a light bulb basically at about his belly button, and the, coil, the, the, the hula hoop, the wire in front of him, is basically wirelessly getting energy from a coil elsewhere in Tesla's lab. But no investors come forward in the mid-1890s, and Tesla is frustrated and tries his hand at a couple of other technologies, a couple of other inventions, such as x-rays and the remote control boat. But Tesla also gets thinking about how his system should ideally work. Now, Maxwell's big insight and I guess this is, this, is, this is hairy technical point number 3.5, 2.5. I got, I got one more really hairy slide for you, okay? So this is 2.5. Maxwell said, the waves that I have discovered, the radio waves that are invisible, that Hertz detected, are just like light waves, okay? So they're across a spectrum varying in frequencies. So you got light waves you got x-rays, you got radio waves, you got short waves, you got a whole range of things. Tesla said, Maxwell said, they're all the same. They all travel in straight lines forever and ever and ever and ever. Okay? Tesla says, well, that's a really dumb idea because if I build, as he's done here, whoops, that's the next hairy, slide, hairy technical slide. If I build a big Tesla coil, and it's generating lots of electric waves up here in this, this bright cloud, they're all going off in every different direction forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. They're going to moon. They're going to Mars. They're going to Jupiter. They're not going to whatever handy-dandy receiver I might have here. This is a really waste of my time and energy. So again, thinking like a maverick, Tesla says, no, 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 no. Two things come out of my circuits. I can make radio waves or I can make a ground current. Let's minimize the radio waves that are going off in space, never to be seen again. Let's maximize the ground current. This leads us to the third, and I promise, last hairy technical slide. Your average electrical engineer, radio engineer of the 19th century, like Marconi, late 19th century, you're thinking like what you see on the top half of this slide. You got a transmitter, you got a receiver. You got an antenna, you got an antenna, you got a ground connection. So how does the whole thing work? Well, Mr. Carlson, I'll t I'm glad you let us tell you. 
You got a transmitter here, basically generates electric waves, go up to the antenna, and yes, they go beep, 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 over to the antenna here, down to the receiver where they're detected, and the whole circuit is completed. In other words, it's a loop because there is a current that flows from a plate down in the ground to a plate over here connected to the transmitter, and everybody is happy. Tesla says, let's think about this in an entirely different direction. Remember, we're going to minimize the electromagnetic waves and we're going to maximize the ground current. So the transmitter generates oscillating electric currents that go into the ground, go through the Earth's crust, beep, 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 meet that ground connection at the receiver, and then you complete the circuit up here in the sky. Okay? This is complete maverick thinking. The way that most radio, most radio explanations work is up here. Tesla is thinking about this in an entirely different way. Now, before you sort of say, he must have been out of his mind, when Marconi wins the Nobel Prize for radio in 1915, Marconi has no idea from a theoretical scientific sense why his ideas work. And he devotes his entire, Marconi devotes his entire Nobel lecture to sort of saying, you know, kind of hand waving, well, it really kind of, kind of works this way, because he has no idea what actually Marconi no does as to what's actually happening in the sky. We now know that there is a, a layer called the Kennelly, Kennelly Heaviside layer in the atmosphere where radio waves basically, basically come off the antenna bounce off this ionosphere layer and come back down to Earth so they don't actually travel in straight lines endlessly the way that Maxwell predicted. Tesla works out and he says, I'm going to pursue this idea that I'm showing you here on the bottom, side, bottom half of the slide. And in 1899, he goes to Colorado Springs. And there he builds the biggest Tesla coil ever, the part of the Tesla coil, which is the primary coil, is here in the middle, and this thing that looks like a fence, this is Tesla here, I'll tell you about him in a minute, is, is basically part of a 50 foot in diameter circle that basically makes the other half, the secondary, of the Tesla coil. Now, when he was operating this, this is the transmitter, this is the receiver, okay? So when he's operating this, you wouldn't see all of these sparks he basically would be pump, pumping the energy down into the earth out to some sort of receiver out in the backyard. Okay, and this is indeed in the backyard of Tesla's experimental station in Colorado Springs. There are the Rocky Mountains on the other side of Colorado Springs. And this coil would have been the detector that would have ca captured enough energy to light up this little teeny tiny bulb. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you have seen the prestige where you see this beautiful field of light bulbs lit up, it never happened. I know, I know, <gasps> when I realized that I was heartbroken. But Tesla did demonstrate, at least to his satisfaction, that this great big transmitter could send energy to that little tiny bulb. And he felt that out in Colorado Springs, he had got confirmation that he could transmit power wirelessly through the earth. In January 1900, he goes back to New York and he says, ladies and gentlemen, in eight months, I'm going to transmit power across the Atlantic. And in 18 months, I'm going to transmit it across the Pacific. Uh, to promote his ideas, he basically publishes an article in Century Magazine, the equivalent of what's today, perhaps the Atlantic, the New Yorker magazines, um, and explains what he wants to do. And he says, I'm going to solve all the problems related to human energy. He's so confident of the success that he moves into the Waldorf, uh, uh, Waldorf Astoria Hotel, then the, the top hotel in New York City, uh, dresses like, like, like a millionaire, um, walks down Fifth Avenue, you know, magnif you know, magnificently turned out, dines in the finest places, rubs elbows with the likes of, of J.P. Morgan and other top investors. And I think he really gets in his mind that if I act like a winner, I talk like I've got a solution, I act like I'm a, I've got a solution, and everybody believes me, then the solution will follow. 
because I'm pretty sure I'm on the right track with everything I saw in Colorado Springs. In an amazing turn of events, in the end of, in, in, at the very end of 1901, about Thanksgiving time, um, Tesla secures a loan from the richest man in the world at that time, J.P. Morgan, a loan of $150,000. Now, to put this into context, about the same time that Morgan loans Tesla $150,000 without blinking an eye, Morgan buys for $150,000. Sight unseen, the Duchess, um, a famous painting by Gainsborough, um, the Duchess, I'm going to say the Duchess of Marlborough, but I may, I probably have the wrong painting. I have the wrong painting, don't I, Jane? Duchess of Devonshire. Okay. All right, so, you know, so, you know, an old master's painting or invest in a crazy guy like Tesla. About the same thing in, in Morgan's mind. Tesla takes that money um, and begins to build a power station, a new experimental station on the north shore of, of uh, Long Island uh, at Warden Cliff. This building still exists. This tower is blown up in 1918. Interesting story you can ask me about. Um, but the key thing is, is remember, he's not sending energy through the sky off the top of that tower. The interesting thing is, is, is he, he builds a shaft down a, basically underneath the tower where he puts iron pipes and he hopes that he would be able to, from an electromagnetic sense, get a grip on the earth and shake it. Now, by this time, early 1900s, 1900, 1901, he's got to deal with a, with a contender, and that is Marconi from Italy. Marconi, in his own right, beginning in the mid-1890s, again inspired by Maxwell and Hertz, is experimenting with coming up with a wireless telegraphy system. And there's a clue in the name. Mar Marconi is interested in sending dots and dash messages using radio waves. And he basically develops this and gets people in, in England to back him by doing it incrementally. First a mile, then five miles, then 20 miles, and across the English Channel. But Marconi quickly realizes in 1901, early 1901, that if he doesn't kind of get his act together, he's going to be scooped by Tesla. And so Te Marconi builds a big power station on the very south, the the southwestern edge of England, down in Cornwall. So he's as close to England as he, as close as he can be in Europe to to North America, and then he goes to Newfoundland, which is the closest part of North America to, to Europe. And in December of 1901, Marconi and his assistant hear a faint Morse code message sent from Cornwall to Newfoundland, um, three dots that represent the S in Morse code. This makes the front page of the New York Times two days later. Tesla, excuse me, Tesla is no longer seen as the inventor of radio Marconi is seen as the new bright young kid in this field of this fast moving field of technology. So, he took $150,000 from JP Morgan. Going backwards for a minute, you built an elaborate laboratory on the North Shore of Long Island, and you've been scooped by Marconi. So, what do you tell the richest man in the world? Again, we might tuck our tail between our legs and go, oh, I kind of screwed up. I don't know what to do. Not Tesla. Tesla comes out punching. He says to, Mark, he says to, says to Morgan in a letter, he says, we are going to build a world telegraphy system. We're going to put a major power plant, major transmitting station near every major city each powerful enough to reach the rest of the world. Those plants are going to collect from their city, London, New York, Paris, Tokyo, all the information, all the telegrams, telephone messages, stock quotes, newspaper stories, and as fast as they get it, they're going to pump it into the earth and they're going to broadcast it. They're going to transmit it around the world. And every individual is going to have 
their own little receiver, as Tesla would like to say, no bigger than a pocket watch. Now, yes, I don't have an iPhone. I have the last BlackBerry phone. But it's no bigger than a pocket watch. And in this letter from 1902, Tesla tells Morgan, the whole earth, whole earth is like a brain, as it were, and the capacity of this system is infinite. You see, Mr. Morgan, the revolutionary character of this idea, its civilizing potency, and its tremendous money-making power. I find it fascinating that in 1902, not necessarily knowing all about computers or packet switching or a ton of other stuff, Tesla had the vision of something that was like the World Wide Web and smartphones. One of the, my favorite versions of this is, is this newspaper story from 1904. And here's the tower at Wardenclyffe on Long Island. It's broadcasting power, so you could be down here on your sailboat and, or your yacht, and you could be getting messages, or you could be out camping, and you take the pole from your tent, and you'd use that as your antenna. But my all-time favorite, and I apologize if you can't necessarily see this clearly, is the lady who's perhaps at Saratoga Springs or down on the Jersey Shore where I grew up, and she wants the latest news, she wants to get her messages from her friends, and she holds up her parasol. And the messages are beamed down to her receiver, no bigger than a pocket watch, perhaps in her pocket, perhaps in her purse. Now, what happens to this brilliant idea? Morgan and Tesla talk about raising a company that is going to manufacture the receivers. He thinks the money is in the receivers, not necessarily in providing the service. Kind of the reverse of what cell phone companies do for us today. In other words, they'll almost give you the phone for free, and then they'll sock you for the service. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's as we say in the entrepreneurship business, it's a double, double revenue model. The question is, is which model, which revenue are you going to man, maximize? So Morgan and Tesla for a couple of years talk about this, but in the meantime, a couple of real scumbags, and that, yes, is a historical term, name, namely Lita Forst, and his backer, Abraham White, set up their own radio company, and what they do is, is this, they basically go out to unsuspecting people and they say, ladies and gentlemen, radio, wireless telegraphy is the next big thing. Don't you want to get on the ground floor? Don't you want to buy stock in our company? And people buy stock in their company and DeForest and White basically take the money and they put it in their pockets and they build splendid houses and they basically abscond with the money, okay? They're ripoff artists. Morgan and other Wall Street bankers, for a whole bunch of reasons I won't get into here, look at this thing and they suddenly realize the entire radio business, this is now 1903, so it's very early on, is, 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 a, is basically a scam. And Morgan tells Tesla, and this is from Tesla's own testimony, that he would not touch wireless companies with a 20-foot pole. In other words, he's going to distance himself from all of this. Because remember, he's, he's the sky on. He is the king of Wall Street. So for him to get tangled up in fly-by-night, scurrilous companies in wireless is a bad idea. So Morgan, after 1903, refuses to invest any more money in Tesla's project. Tesla got the $150,000, and that was it. As a result... Over the next couple of years, Tesla fires off a series of letters, which are fascinating to read. On one hand, they're psychophantic. Oh, dear Mr. Morgan, you're the smartest man in the world. You know, love and kisses, blah, 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 blah. And then the next one is, you jerk, you ripped me off, you did this. Didn't you know I'm the greatest inventor in the entire world? I'm not so sure I'd necessarily write a letter along those lines. I regularly have PhD students that want to say something along those, and I'm always kind of reeling them in. Eh, I'm not sure, Biff, that I'd say that. Okay, so back and forth, you know, real psychophanic letters and then, like, you know, really insulting letters. So he goes back and forth. His, 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 clearly, his mental state is not great. At the same time, he becomes close friends 
after the Spanish-American War with a hero from that war, naval war hero, named Richmond P. Hobson, and they become very close. And right in the middle of, of this whole thing, in 1904-1905, Hobson basically decides that he's not going to be a naval officer any longer. He wants to run for Congress, but to run for Congress, he needs to have a wife by his side. He kind of needs to look like he's, he's sort of a normal American. Um, he's been dating this woman named, yes, Griselda. Um, and he basically writes Tesla, and he says, I have decided to marry Griselda, and you were the first person that needs to know this because you op occupy the deepest chambers of my heart. That's what Hobson says in a letter to Tesla. Okay, I'll let you kind of think about that for a while. Anyhow, this breaks Tesla's heart. Okay, he can't make the technology, he can't, make, he can't do the business deals with Morgan, he can't raise any additional money. Hobson leaves him, and he begins to write letters, Tesla does, um, that he's seriously ill, can't leave his hotel room, and he signs these letters, Nicola Busted. Now, he's got business problems, he's got social, he's got personal problems, but more importantly, would his wireless power system at Wardenclyffe have ever worked? And I finally decided after a long time of studying this that it all comes down to, I have a, it's a sort of bizarre question, but it comes down to a question is, is from an electromagnetic standpoint, is the Earth like the ocean or like a water balloon? Okay. If the Earth is like a water balloon, okay, this is, this is the electromagnetic piece, but imagine if it's a water balloon, and you got the balloon filled up with water, and you got a little pump here, and you begin to pump with a regular rhythm energy waves into the balloon. Once you reach the resonant frequency of the vessel, the balloon, with each successive pump, a little bit of water will squirt out of these one-way valves all around the balloon. Now, that presupposes that the Earth is filled with an inelastic medium, okay? That you basically, you punch it kind of, you push it on one side, and you get a result out the other side. The problem is, is this from, again, an electromagnetic standpoint, the Earth doesn't function like a water balloon, it functions like an ocean. So I grew up on the Jersey Shore. And one of those kind of philosophical questions that would always come up when we go to the beach when I was a little kid is, is if I throw a stone in the ocean, do the waves from my stone, when it hits the water, you know, ripple across the ocean all the way to Spain? I don't know why, why we were so caught up on Spain, but we always thought from New Jersey that the thing straight across the other side of the ocean was Spain. Okay. Anyhow, well, of course they don't because the, the ocean is an elastic medium and over time the waves disappear. They dissipate into the ocean. Tesla thought that the Earth functioned like a water balloon when in reality it functioned like an ocean. Tesla could never wrap his brain around this and ultimately in 1905 he had a complete nervous breakdown because he couldn't raise the money, he had lost his best friend Hobson, and he technically could not make Wardenclyffe work, and he could not accept the fact that what he had theorized in his mind would never actually work in reality. A couple more slides. Okay? In his later years, after that breakdown, and now we're into the, 19, 19, into the 20th century, from 1905 to the 1930s, Tesla is basically bankrupt, works on a number of different ideas, including a bladeless steam turbine. He lives in various New York hotels. He stays in a hotel until he runs the bill up to a point where they get tired of having him there, um, and then he moves to another hotel. Um, in 1934, still hoping to be in the public limelight, he tells newspaper reporters at an annual interview that he always has on his birthday on the 10th of July that he has uh, perfected a particle beam weapon that can shoot down airplanes, shoot down bombers that might fly across the Atlantic Ocean and attack New York City, attack New York or other American cities. And people sort of think, well, that's sort of interesting. When he dies in 1943, J. Edgar Hoover basically says, we're not taking any chances. 
let's go to have a look at his papers and figure out whether he had any secrets or not. They send a physicist from MIT, the physicist has the name of John G. Trump, yes, he is the uncle of the 45th president of the United States, and Professor Trump concludes that Tesla has no real idea for how to actually build a particle beam weapon. Tesla's papers are nonetheless held by the New York state government because Tesla died and did not pay his estate taxes, and only in the early 1950s did the U.S. government release the papers, the Yugoslav government paid the back taxes, and his papers ultimately wound up in a museum, which you can visit today, in, Be in Belgrade, Serbia. One of the interesting things is, is, is when I was starting out in the history of technology business in the 1970s, Edison was all the rage. He was the hero. And today, Tesla's become popular again. And you might under, uh, ask why. Part of it is, this is straightforward. He's tall, he's dark, he's handsome, he's mysterious. Another part is, is this is Tesla is the classic underdog, always pushing against big business. Remember, with his wireless power system, he was going to pull an end run around AT&T, General Electric, Westinghouse. So he was going to ups, up, upset the status quo. And he was promising the availability of free energy. And Tesla, I think, is attractive in the 90s and the 2000s to people who want an interesting mix, the new age people who want cutting edge technology but don't want to have to deal with the rationality of either science or the marketplace. You can have, as Tesla says, follow my mystical, my visionary beliefs. You can have wonderful new technology, but you don't have to study the science. You don't have to be limited by the forces of corporate America. As I said, Tesla was an inventor, an artist, and an entrepreneur. As an inventor, to sum up, he had one major success, the alternating current motor. He had one bold vision, wireless power. He was an entrepreneur. Lots of people write off his business side, but he had a business strategy, patent, promote, and sell. He had an interesting idea what he was going to do with wireless power. He was going to sell the receivers, charge you for those, but he was going to give away the information or the power for free. But I think the really interesting thing was this is he was, an, was very much an artist. His critics always sort of said, ah, Tesla, the poet and the visionary. And they were probably on to something because they were picking up on his artistic side. He was concerned as much about the social meanings, what we would think about, what we would dream about when we talked about his technologies as much as their functionality. And I think his inventions came from the fact that he had an inner ideal. He had a thing in his heart or in his mind that he struggled to impose on the world. He was a subjective thinker, to use phraseology from, from Joseph Schumpeter. And that's what makes him interesting. And that's why we're still fascinated with him. What would Tesla be doing today? I think he'd be focused on a big cultural theme. I think he'd be fascinated by social media. He'd be fascinated by how individuals are accessing and utilizing vast amounts of information, again, on personal devices. This, this would, I think, just animate him no end. And he'd be inventing, using both science and ideas from popular culture. And he would be always looking for that chance to be the maverick, to be the outsider. But above all, he'd be inviting us to dream boldly, but think hard. Thank you, and I appreciate your time, and I'd be glad to take some questions. Okay. All right, so, uh, we'll go ahead and open the floor for questions. We've got about 10, 15 minutes, so I'll start right over here. Yeah, I have two questions. Two Please. questions. Number one is, how many patents did he have? And number two is, did he have any scientific publications 
any publications in the scientific literature. Okay, so the first question is, is how many patents did, did Tesla have? My sense is, is this he had, um, and I don't have the number right in front of me, but he had about 146 patents over the course of his career. You will see numbers on the World Wide Web that suggest that he had hundreds. Those are counting the, the, all of the European and worldwide patents, okay, which often are duplicates of the American patents. He had scientific publications that were in major engineering journals up to about 1893, 94, 95. Um, and then he decided that he really didn't want to worry about peer what we today would call peer-reviewed publications. And so we could have a whole separate conversation about the Tesla is caught in an interesting moment, which he is very much a 19th century scientist inventor following a set of rules from that standpoint, and he doesn't make the transition to the 20th century rules of professional science and engineering. And he, he basically, he makes a conscious choice and he doesn't maintain his, his sort of professional status. So I hope I, 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 trick here is to give you good information, but say it concisely so we can, you know, get lots of questions in. But a great question. How, how much truth is there to the story that um, he would have been the richest man in the world if he had not renegotiated a uh, contract with George Westinghouse on how much money he was paid for every horsepower right. per engine? So the question is, he's about the, con the basically the deal, the contract deal that Tesla did with, with Westinghouse. Um, and the contract basically said that for every horsepower of electric motors that would be installed, Tesla would receive $2.50. And I did a series of calculations. He was supposed to get some money in some other ways out of that contract, but he probably made about $150,000 off of that contract. Now, what happens is, is in 1891, there's a quick sudden downturn in the economy. Westinghouse, has, as a manufacturing company, has overextended itself, gotten him, basically goes bankrupt, and is reorganized by business, by bankers. And the bankers basically say to Westinghouse, if George, if you want to stay in charge of the company, you have to basically get rid of these contracts with these open-ended promises, like this royalty deal you have with Tesla. So Westinghouse goes to Tesla and says, I want to stay in charge of the company, will you basically tear up the contract? And Tesla, being a man of honor, George Westinghouse supported him at a critical moment in his career, tears up, tears up the contract. Now, how much money would he, Tesla have ever made off of that contract? It would have taken a long time because it is not until 1896, 1897 that the Westinghouse company actually figures out how to make serious motors based on the Tesla patents. So when he basically tears up the contract, it's not clear. Where Tesla made his money in the 1890s was on the European patents for the motor, which he exclusively controlled. That's a part of the story that I chased down as far as I could, but most people don't know that. So he never would have been, in my opinion, the richest man in the world in answer to your question. So here we go. I may have missed it. Uh, were you going to say more about that photograph with him sitting oh, yes. in his chair and with all the electricity? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, 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 I missed. I, you, I appreciate you bringing that up. I was uh, uh, trying to be disciplined in honor of my hosts. And uh, so we get at least back to the smaller version. Oh, there we go. Whoops. Okay. So the interesting part about this particular picture is, is it looks like Tesla is sitting there reading a book in the middle of his experimental station in Colorado, um, and all of these lightning bolts are going off over him. And the interesting thing about that photograph is this Tesla, in his notes, tells us that it's actually a trick photograph. It's a double exposure. So Tesla first sits in the chair, reading his book, um, and they use some flash photography so you could kind of see, see, you know, see the, basically see his face, see the details. He then gets out of the chair, and they crank up 
the transmitter, the generator, and throw off these 100-foot lightning bolts. The interesting thing is you sort of say, well, well, what's going on here? Tesla says, as he says, look, I really was struggling to come up with a way to create, help you see, visualize, create the illusion of how much power was involved in this station. And the only way to do it was to basically generate these great big lightning bolts and for you to have some perspective on them, I had to sit there. You also, there's a series of photographs where he's not sitting there, but the photographer is actually sitting there, uh, huddled up because they did these in December of 1899, and the guy's got a great big fur hat on, and he's, cold, he's, he's, he's clearly freezing to death because there's a blizzard happening outside, you know, in Colorado Springs. But it's a trick photograph. And... Uh, it's an interesting thing to think about Tesla's, you know, why he would make that photograph. What, what does that have to do with illusions? All the way over here. Yes, sir. Where do you think the next disruptive uh, inventions are going to come from? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I think we're beginning to, to see it with, um, with you know, self-driving cars. I think that self-driving cars could be highly disruptive. Uh, my students are all, my engineering students are all crazy about Bitcoin. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not convinced about Bitcoin whatsoever. Um, I think we also need to be watching um, from the, you know, in the area of certain parts of biotechnology. I think we will see some, some pretty amazing things there. Uh, but, you know, I, the, what's interesting is I don't think we're about to see you know, and again, this is my opinion, you know, in terms of electronics and information technology and computers, I think we, we may be leveling out there. I mean, what the, the sort of stuff that my colleagues at the engineering school are working on is, you know, is, is, is good stuff, but it's, it's, not a, it's, not, it's not going to be game changing. It's not going to create that sixth or seventh wave that we need on the Kondriev curve. We have Time for one last question here. Thank you. Uh, what about the information about Tesla being fodder for comic books as the mad scientist? So in the, um, in the 20s and 30s. Right. So Tesla, I think, really is um, you know one of the one of the archetypes, one of the inspirations for the archetype of the mad scientist. He's not the only one, but he, he certainly is, is, is informing that, that, whole, that whole genre. He, he clearly is lurking around in the back of novelists such as Anne Rand when she writes The Fountainhead or um, Atlas Shrugged. In fact, there's some distinct, you know, clear references in Atlas Shrugged to, to Tesla. Um, and, and, and he really does represent this sort of pure ideal of, of sort of pursuing science and technology with no real sense of the business implications, and that, that clearly fires people's imaginations. One of the interesting things that I found out, and, you know, you can imagine as a, as a uh, publishing author was, is this, is I thought I was doing pretty well with... Um, you know, with, with my biography, which has done okay, but it's nothing compared to the fact that a, a, in, a South Asian, i.e. Indian American, produced a Tesla comic book, um, which he sold to Scholastic, uh, which is, uh, is, as some of you may know, sells books to elementary and middle schools, and that guy sold half a million copies of this Tesla-based comic book. And I've, I've had conversations with him, and it's like, eh, you can talk to this guy, but he is, he's wound up in the myth that he wants to present. He's wound up in trying to figure out how you locate Tesla in the comic book genre, and he has a little bit of trouble with a, guy, with a history guy like me who sort of says, mm, there's this thing called factual truth. Anyhow, but I appreciate the question. I appreciate you uh, coming out tonight. I, I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I'll be out in the lobby to talk a little bit more. So before we send Professor Carlson back to sign uh, his books and anything else you want to hand him, I think he'll probably sign, uh, let's remind you what's coming up next week here in Great Lives. We, on Tuesday the 13th, we have the Tuskegee Airmen, which is one we've had a request for. So we're really pleased to be bringing this by Todd Moy. Everyone help me thank Professor Carlson one more time.